station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston Station, we are ready for the event. WCCO TV, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Mike Augustinak with WCCO TV. How do you hear me? Mike, great to hear your voice. We have you loud and clear. Very good. Gentlemen, I have to tell you, this is the thrill of a lifetime for us to have this opportunity to speak with both of you, but specifically you, Mark, because we know you graduated from St. John's University and went to high school at Benilde St. Margaret's. One of my most accomplished weather interns also went to school there, so I know they have some top-notch science classes. But, Mark, I, I wanted to ask you, how did your general interest in space turn into, I'm going to be an astronaut? Wow, I always thought uh, space was this amazing area to explore, and I thought it would be wonderful to do it. I never, ever thought that I would become an astronaut. I thought that you kind of had to be a superhero to be an astronaut, and I feel like I was just extremely fortunate. I, uh, the Army put me in a good position so that when somebody asked me if I wanted to work at NASA, I could say yes, and uh, that just led to having this job and being on the space station right now. I'm sometimes very puzzled by the fact that I actually got this far. <laughs> well, uh, I kind of I feel the same way. I mean, a lot of accomplished people, including me, struggled with something in high school. Even though I have a lot of physics and math background, I really struggled with chemistry, and yet here I am as a meteorologist. I wonder if both you and Shane had a similar experience like that, maybe in high school or in college, and if so, if you guys could give some advice to other students who maybe feel the same way. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, you know, I think we all have struggled, and that's part of the reason we're here, is that uh, we weren't afraid to fail. Uh, we try things sometimes that we weren't very good at them, but we just worked really hard. We learned how to have really good habits by just working hard at things we weren't great at. Um, obviously, we like things that we're good at. That's easier for everybody. Uh, but some of the things that we weren't so good at, Mark and I, um, throughout our careers, I'm sure we've gone after just so that we could expand our learning and expand our background. So that's what I would tell folks. Um, try to do things that maybe you're not so great at uh, and just work really hard. And you'll, you'll be amazed at kind of the doors that open up for you. I know that each of you have walked in space. Can you explain what that feeling is like the first time that you ever step outside? You know, I'm actually going to explain the third time I went outside. I'm going to try to keep this quick because the, uh, the first two times I went outside, I went feet first, and I was trained to do that in the pool, um, in, a, in a pool where the floor of the pool is only five feet below the uh, hatchway. And as soon as I came out, um, everything looked like the mock-up of the space station that was in the pool. So my comfort blanket was there. But the third time, I had to open the hatch and go out head first, and there was a time period when I could, in my limited field of view, see nothing of the space station and only the Earth 240 miles below me. And that was pretty challenging. I had to definitely concentrate on my breathing to, slow, to, to stay calm. Um, even though I had already spent more than 10 hours outside the space station, that was an a interesting moment. And the fourth time, I thought, oh, this will be no problem. I've done this before. I opened the hatch and same exact response came. My heart started beating really fast. No matter what, um, you still got to push through some hard things sometimes. So that's the most exciting part maybe of being in space or one of them. But um, Shane, what's, we won't tell NASA, I promise. What's like the most boring or annoying part of living on the International Space Station? You see us smiling all the time, right? I mean, this is unbelievable that we get to do this. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, there's, I don't think there's anything boring up here. Our days are always different. Uh, we're always working hard on either experiments or maintenance around the space station or working out ourselves physically. So um, we all like, the, I think, the variety of things that we get to do every day. And I tell you, I haven't been bored yet. I've been up here for a lot of days. I just went over 200. Mark's about to hit 200 days here next week. Um, and so I haven't had a boring day yet. Well, because you guys will retire at some point uh, from NASA, I found a few future astronauts that have some questions for you. These questions come from first through fifth grade students at Whittier International Elementary School in Minneapolis. And we'll start with Abdiraman. How do you sleep while you're floating around? 
I sleep while I'm floating around. Um, basically, we have a sleeping bag. Each of us has what I'd say is about the size of a phone booth, for those of you who remember what phone booths are. Um, place that's our own private space. My sleeping bag is hanging up on the wall there. Um, when I first got to the space station, I felt like I needed to be pressed against the wall to feel like I was in a bed. But eventually I got really comfortable just floating, disconnected everything except the shoulders of my sleeping bag. And I go in that room and I just free float. It's, uh, you can't get a better water bed, that's for sure. I've heard that some cosmic rays or, or interstellar radiation can sometimes cause flashes of light if your eyes are closed. Do you guys ever experience that while you're trying to get to sleep? Yeah, I've, I've experienced that a few times. It's not every night. And, uh, of course, you've got to be alert enough with your eyes closed to actually recognize it. But um, it just it's, uh, yeah, it just kind of looks like a spark or something like that. Um, Marvin asked, what do you eat in space? Hey, Marvin, we eat uh, a lot of really interesting food. Um, it's, it's a lot of times it's a food that like the military eats. So they're from like MREs. Uh, so a lot of it's rehydratable and a lot of it, the other part of it is just heat, you know, we just heat it up. So uh, we have a great variety this time. I mean, it's, it's the food lab has done a great job at the Johnson Space Center um, preparing our food and our menus. And we have everything you can imagine um, from like pork chops to chicken to beef. Um, to seafood and other things that um, they have in pouches for us. So um, it's a lot of soft food. We don't get a lot of crunchy things. So that's, uh, I think, something that we miss after we've been up here a while are things like salads and lettuce and chips and things like that that are crunchy. But uh, the variety is very good. We also have Russian food because we have cosmonauts on board and they share it with us sometimes. And that's really great food. Um, we have a French and a Japanese astronaut on our flight. So we get some French and some Japanese food as well. So the key about space food, I think, is just variety. All right, well, mark me down for a Moscow mule for sure uh, next time I come up to visit. Torsten wants to know, what kinds of experiments are you doing on the space station right now? Gosh, there are hundreds of experiments we're doing on the space station. We've got uh, experiments that help us better prepare to explore, explore further away from Earth than we have been lately. We've got experiments that help life on Earth. In fact, there's a... Uh, experiment I spent about five hours working on today that's called celestial immunity. And we're, we've got uh, blood cells, I believe, from uh, donors, both young adults and elderly. And we're using the fact that being in space causes rapid changes in our immune systems to help study with greater rapidity how we can uh, under, understand our immune systems and, and possibly resulting in medications that are, that are able to help us out. Well, we've all learned how important that, that type of study is, especially in the past year. Um, staying safe is, is a big part of what you need to do on a daily basis up there. So what do you do if there's a meteor or space debris in your path? So we don't get that very often. Um, it happens, I don't know, maybe a handful of times a year at the most. And uh, Mission Control will let us know. Um, we have people that track that, that sort of thing. Um, and then they let NASA know, and then NASA lets us know. Um, usually it's well in advance, and so they have, we have a couple options where they can move the space station out of the way is one option. Um, if it's late in the game, um, they, they would just tell us to go get in a certain part of the space station, or if it's really going to be close and it's late, they'll have us go get in our vehicles um, just in case something hit the space station. We could undock and then come home safely. All right, one quick last question for Mark. Mark, do you have any WCCO memories growing up or any Twin Cities memories? I have a tremendous number of uh, Twin Cities memories. Um, ice skating, cross-country skiing. Um, I certainly would credit uh, Minnesota winters with starting me on the path for getting comfortable in extreme environments. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Enjoy the rest of your stay. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the WCCO TV portion of the event. Please stand by for a voice check from West Point.
Station, this is Cadet Jacob Willis with West Point. How do you hear me? Hey, Jacob, we have you loud and clear. Awesome. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, thank you for your time. I'm giving us your experiences of what it's like up in the um, International Space Station. Um, we, have, we have a few questions for you. Um, starting up with um, Cadet Henry Carroll, class of 23, company G3. Gentlemen, you have both been through a handful of schools and selection processes designed to eliminate the vast majority of candidates who've been, who began them. What would you say is the defining character or personality trait that has allowed you to um, consistently find success in situations designed to produce failure? Well, thanks for the question. Um, you know, there's a lot of things, traits that go into that. I think humility is a big part of it. I think, you know, working hard is obviously a big deal. Being a good team player, learning how to be a leader when you need to lead, learning how to be a follower when you need to follow. Um, all of those things are things that, you know, I started learning back at West Point and uh, learned how to grow, grow those kind of, uh, you know, traits throughout my Army career and then my NASA career. Um, like you said, we, we've been to a lot of schools where they try to eliminate you, and uh, this was kind of a, a, a small funnel getting into the astronaut corps as well. Um, you know, to me, all these jobs and things I've had in schools I've gone to, it's all about people. So taking care of people, um, if you're in a leadership position, um, for me, just I'm really diving in, investing in my people, proved to be a pretty good um, pathway to get to where, where I am today. Thank you, sir. We have another question from Casey Comar, Class 22, Company F1. How has this space flight differed from your previous ones? What were you ready for and what were you unprepared for? Honestly, my last flight, I uh, felt like I was super well prepared. It was the first time I was in space and it was extremely humbling. I trained for years only to get up here and feel like I was the behind the schedule all the time, losing stuff. I was really, really hard on myself. This time coming back, um, it feels very different because it, it, it just continued on from the previous experience. Uh, I feel very comfortable up here right away. Um, I've got, a, just like last time, it's a great crew, having a good time together. Uh, and I think I'm, what, I'm, what I'm finding mentally is I'm just being a lot easier on myself. I'm, if, if something goes wrong, I'm just saying, it's okay. It's, you know, don't, sometimes you just got to accept things the way they are and move on and work hard on the next thing. Thank you, sir. I'm sure I can relate with that sentiment right there. Um, <laughs> um, we have a, um, another question from uh, Major Logan Phillips, class of 2009, company C1. In the light of the recent SpaceX launch, what roles will private enterprise and commercial space travel play in the future of space operations? Yeah, we can only uh, hypothesize on that now, but it looks like it's on a great track for you know non-professional astronauts to be flying in space. You may have heard about Inspiration Four. SpaceX is going to launch four, you know, private citizens here in the uh, this coming fall. Um, and they're going to go to space for a couple of days in the Crew Dragon, and they're, they're going to land back off the coast of Florida. So that's kind of a first step, I think, to get you know non-professional astronauts. And it looks like um, that's something that SpaceX is very interested in. I think other companies um, like Blue Origin are very interested as well. So there, uh, there's a lot of people going on in this, a lot of things going on in the space business um, outside of NASA uh, in the private sector, which is going to enable those things you're talking about. Thank you, sir. Our fourth question is from Cadet Ramsey Rubia, Class 22, Company I-4. What is the most interesting research project or experiment that you've conducted on the ISS? Actually, I'd like to talk about one experiment that I worked on a big chunk of my day today. Um, it's called celestial immunity. One of the things that happens in space is our immune systems change rapidly. And there was uh, cell donors on the Earth, both young adults and elderly people, who uh, provided those samples. And we are doing experiments on those up here to try to better understand how the immune system changes. As you can imagine, anytime you can take out one of the variables, you can learn more about how the system works. So we are in a free float. We are in a free float environment up here. So things behave differently, and we're going to use that to better understand our immune systems.
Thank you, sir. Um, our next question comes from Major Josh Herrera, class of 2010, Company C2. How did teaching at West Point prepare you for your time at NASA and in space? Well, for me, um, obviously, I, I, well, I taught in the math department, Mark taught in the physics department. I think both of us um, really had to study pretty hard to be able to teach the subject. So it taught us a lot about, uh, you know, teaching ourselves and really studying hard. Uh, but for me, the biggest um, advantage of teaching at West Point was just working with the cadets. Um, I didn't really want to go do that that tour. Um, believe it or not, I wanted to go back to the to what I'll call the real army and, and be a, a helicopter pilot and go shoot things. But um, my career path kind of led me to go teach at West Point, and it was honestly the most rewarding experience I've had in the army, um, just because of the experience I got to have with cadets. So, how does that help us at NASA? Well. Um, you know, we have people that we work with all the time. We're better team players, I think, because of our experience at West Point um, and just uh, being able to influence, you know, maybe have a little bit of influence over the cadets while we were there was a huge inspiration for me. Uh, and hopefully we can do the same at uh, NASA, at Johnson Space Center in Houston. Thank you, sir. And I got nope. really good at sophomore physics. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I remember one of my favorite parts of the um, core physics program was the orbital, me orbital mechanics, and that's basically what you're doing right now. <laughs> um, our next question comes from Major Seven Hoke, class of 2006, company E3. Who is responsible for selecting experiments abroad, uh, aboard the ISS, and how are they prioritized? I don't have the exact answer for that. I know there's been a uh there's organizations that take care of that for us. Uh, I'd like to highlight that uh, all those experiments we do on the space station, on the U.S. segment of the space station, um, specifically the U.S. experiments, come through Huntsville. So Huntsville, Alabama, we've got a NASA center there. And uh, we talk to them every day uh, as they integrate uh, primary investigators into the system to be able to help coach us through the experience, experiments that they've developed, they're going to analyze, and they're going to write papers about. All right. Thank you, sir. Um, I think we're just about running out of time. Um, thank you for um, speaking off the with us today. Actually, we have one more time for one more question. Final question from Cadet Joshua Reese, co class of 2023, company C3. What type of communication problems exist between you and astronauts from other countries where political tensions exist between host countries back on Earth? Well, you know, we all have to learn how to speak Russian, so there's not really a communication barrier there, although some of mine's not near as good as it used to be. <laughs> Um, but, you know, honestly, we're a great model for society. Um, we have all these countries up here working together um, for a common cause. And so I think we're just a great example for, you know, all of humanity back on Earth. And uh, I know Army's playing baseball against Navy this weekend. So uh, you see our Go Army, Beat Navy flag. And I got my baseball hat here ready to go to support the team. So go Army, Beat Navy. Yes, sir. Go Army beat Navy. Let's hope that we can keep it that way for a while, sir. All right. I think this concludes all of our questions. Thank you for your time, gentlemen. All right. Take care. Thanks. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you to all participants from WCCO-TV and West Point. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.